Well, I actually thought we were fairly um, in agreement on many of the substantive issues. I think language becomes a barrier to how you talk about leadership in particular and, and feminism. That um, I was, I, let me just give you a little background from where I'm coming from. I spent my life as a women's activist, um, as in I, I did women's reproductive rights litigation for 30 years. Uh, always taught in a women's studies department at the University of Pennsylvania, Swarthmore, but for the most part, I, I thought of myself and, and continue to think of myself as an activist first, and so as opposed to an academic. So coming to Barnard in an academic may, may you, you know, in, in, in that system, in many ways for me was a real language barrier because the things I talked about, power, leadership, changing of culture, organizational development, did not resonate in a women's studies context. Um, and so I think that to me has been the biggest struggle is how do you, and let me just say it doesn't necessarily, what I also found is it didn't resonate with our students, particularly uh, kids who are coming from a very diverse cultures and, and our international students, our, our students of color, the feminist uh, language that comes out of women's studies often in, in my experience was not resonating and it clearly wasn't resonating with families who today look at a liberal arts education as uh, a start but they want their kids to get jobs so they want uh, they want skill building that will result in employment in addition to skill building that results in critical thinking and citizenship and all of the real hallmarks of a liberal arts education, which I wholeheartedly support. Um, so, but for me, the real, I think the tension was around language more than around substance because I think we all agreed that a, gen a gendered lens on leadership is absolutely essential that it's been missing in the debate, that when you have a literature that comes from the business community, uh, it's totally absent, and more importantly, it's absent in practice. You know, so what I started when I started the Athena Center was from the view that if we knew how to bring women to power and to leadership positionally, that we would have done it already, um, because you know, many of us have been activists for long periods of time and working on these issues, and so we needed to rethink how we approach these issues. Uh, but that power and positional leadership wasn't enough, that we needed to redefine what we meant by leadership to include what I think of as leadership for life. That it is, that is it's both leadership from the top, leadership from the bottom, leadership from the sides, leadership that, frankly, to me is a lot more about identity and about autonomy and about uh, agency than it is about positional power. I think um, for us, especially from the Women's Research Resource Center, Spelman College, uh, some of the contradictions didn't so much lie even among the group of us coming together around feminist leadership, but uh, uh, with the models that exist on our own campus to some extent. I mm -hmm. mean, uh, we have, and you mentioned the, uh, the standard sites of leadership development, for instance, a lead center on our campus that uh, supposedly the designated place to get those leadership skills, but as, in a certain type of way, and a, a way that does sometimes even at an all women's college, repeat those kind of hierarchical kind of values, the careerism that goes along with uh, certain models. Whereas in the Women's Center, we didn't even realize we were doing leadership <laughs> development until the students that passed through many of our programs and practicums became leaders in, in an activist sense and in a, in a way that's not always supported uh, by administrations of all types. So, um, you know, what I'll it, it talk about later at some point with the other, the alternative models that we employ, which have included activist conferences that students develop, when students develop the unconceptualized 
um, and uh, implement themselves as well as activist practicums where students engage with the community in, uh, you know, on the basis of equality, which uh, does not always conform to the kind of corporate and careerist model of leadership that our institutions promote. Um, I think we were at Barnum on the panel for a moment, which I, I challenge the notion that the presence of women in and of itself uh, will produce transformational anything. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and I think right. that is, that is uh, a claim that, that circulates in women's movement, women's studies that just having more women in the room, more women at the table, will uh, result in feminist um, transformation or whatever. And, I, I, and it sort of resonates with uh, some of what Bell Hook said in terms of, of feminism now becoming such a nothing term that everybody uses. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. even some of our students will say that they have their own definition of feminism. <laughs> And it doesn't have to conform to anything that uh, connects. So I think I think that the, 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 the idea of feminism now we move from, and I've said, I actually sometimes wish we were in the old days where people just said, "I'm not a feminist and I don't like it," rather <laughs> <laughs> than saying, "I am." A, you know, everybody will say now that they're feminists, and and uh, you know, even in these, well, that doesn't have it felt in the leadership context. I mean. But, but it is kind of frustrating that somehow the term has been co-opted, mm -hmm. uh, sort of embraced without any connection to, to politics. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's, that's, I don't know that we ever really talked about that, but the way in which now feminism is a term mm -hmm. that, that Sarah Palin and, uh, Yikes. and, and Beyonce <laughs> and anybody can claim. And so, uh, so I, I think that's, that's a complexity. Well, put with me. Can you just, can you can you can can anybody just say, I'm doing feminist leadership. I have my own notion of what that is, definition of what that is. So I just wanted to follow up on what Beverly said by um, uh, saying that it was really Beverly who um, pushed us, I think, in a really productive way to drop women's leadership and move to feminist leadership. And she brought um, a definition to our attention. Um, and so I thought I would just share that because it was, um, it was influential in our conversations. Um, and this is a definition of feminist leadership coming out of Dawn Ontario, the Disabled Women's Network Ontario from 2008. Um, and they said that um, feminist leadership is women and women's organizations sharing power, authority, and decision making in our common pursuit of social, legal, political, economic and cultural equality. So there are two pieces to that. One is it's collective um, versus individualistic. And that was another point of debate for us because there's always the tension between the great man and great woman model versus looking at grassroots collective organizations or movements, which we were probably more interested in, but people did push us. I remember Ruth Mandel was adamant about this. And uh, if you don't know her, she's the head of the, uh, the, the founder of the Center for the American Women in Politics at Rutgers. And she said, we cannot, however, overlook individual women who have, you know, whether they're in decision making uh, positions in elective office or, uh, you know, people who broke uh, social barriers for us individuals. So um, I, I think that was an interesting and productive tension, but we did decide that the feminist. Uh, leadership studies model was the one most of us believed in more and then um, a second definition that was important to us was the one that Sri Latha Bhatliwala provided and I can um, you know just really briefly it's leadership from a feminist standpoint is informed by the power of the feminist lens uh, so we embrace that as well uh, you know there there have been leadership programs around as you noted mm -hmm. for uh, out of time, and, and many, many institutions, not only business uh, schools, have leadership studies. Um, and you began to say a little bit about how a feminist leadership studies program 
would actually look like. And I wonder <coughs> if you could say a little bit more about what would it make, what, what would be different about the program, cur curricularly, extracurricularly? Um, so if you could comment on that. So uh, I'm happy to go first on that one. Uh, so I came to Barnard five years ago to start the Athena Center and really looked at leadership studies all across the country for almost a year just to try to figure out who was doing what and what made sense. And we came up with a, th with a program, and I want to describe it for you. Um, it's really a curricular and co-curricular. The curricular component requires students to take five courses. It starts with women in leadership, three are within any of the courses that are already approved within departments, and the last is a senior seminar. And frankly, it really revolves the theory on the study of gender and the study of organizations. Um, and we picked those two because we didn't think gender alone was sufficient, that so much of leadership really is organizationally based and how organizations change is a really critical component of successful leadership. So that was kind of the underlying theory. But frankly, um, I really like the approach, ironically, in the world that West Point took in terms of their ability to put together theory, practice, and reflection. Now, of course, our underlying values are totally different in terms of what was uh, the heart of the program, but that notion of theory, practice, and reflection to me was really important because I saw too much in students of taking courses and never really understanding what that course had to do with leadership, even when it's called a leadership course, A. Um, and B, they never got an opportunity to actually practice and reflect upon their practice or implement that in, a, in, in some kind of leadership capacity. So it's been a really, really interesting uh, set of projects that the students have come up with, everything from creating a fruit business in Thailand to developing yoga in battered women's shelters to uh, you know, environmental projects, uh, social action projects in cities. I mean, it's really been incredibly varied. A little too much teaching from my end because students are, that's part of their comfort zone. Um, so if they, if they feel like they can uh, teach. But the, I think the other piece that's been really important is that we really challenge them to think about race and class and gender as they're developing those programs and spend some time in the classroom forcing them not only to describe their projects to talk about them, but also to, to challenge what's happening in their model that they've developed. Some of the projects have actually continued. The yoga project I described is now four years old and is uh, continuing to operate others as well. And I think, frankly, it's a really uh, interesting model of how you force students to make something, learn that skill of making something happen and then reflecting on it uh, so that they can uh, take that skill to the next stage of their life. Uh, we, 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 we have several concentrations, but so we, we, one of the things we like to say about our Prepared for Women's Studies program, that's what we call ourselves, probably the only site in the academy that calls itself Prepared for Women's Studies as opposed to a whole range of other things. Uh, but uh, we, we envision the major as uh, having a critical component of feminist leadership, feminist activist leadership development. Mm -hmm. And it's not a, a course Bound, even though, uh, and, and Bahati should talk more than I am. She teaches uh, a women's social movements course and, and a, an activist practicum. And so uh, so that's how we approach it. And we also have several, which Bahati should talk about, several uh, feminist student organizations attached to the center, one of which is the Tony K. Van Barra Collective. So you should really talk about how, how we envision the way we're doing um, feminist leadership studies at Spelman, because it's not uh, it's a different it's model. A different right. model. Yes. Okay. Um, and I, I uh, think, you know, call, calling up some of what Bell Hooks said yesterday, um, I think that our model uh, in terms of being an academic program, a curriculum, and, a set, and programming at the same time as a center kind of harks against what she spoke about and what she wrote about. And I just want to read this briefly. 
Uh, while academic legitimation was crucial to the advancement of feminist thought, it created a new set of difficulties. Suddenly, the feminist thinking that emerged directly from theory and practice received less attention. Feminist thinking and theory were no longer tied to the feminist movement. Academic politics and careerism overshadowed feminist politics. Feminist theory began to be housed in an academic ghetto with little connection to the world outside. As a consequence, the academization of feminist thought in this manner undermines feminist movement via depoliticization. De-radicalized, it is like every other academic discipline with the only difference being a focus on gender. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what we've tried to fight against in terms of the Women's Research and Resource Center at Spelman College with a couple of key components. Uh, not only the, the radical nature of the, the curriculum and the courses, but um, programming that exposes students to actual living scholar activists, like the Tony K. Bombera Scholar Activist Program that goes on year round, and the culminating conference that we have. That is, and the other leadership aspect of that conference is that it is student conceptualized and student driven. So, you know, one of the, in the model incorporates uh, some aspects of the consciousness moving, consciousness raising uh, aspects of the feminist movement. So we carry that tradition on, as well as kind of forcing the students to be leaders, to lead the, the conference. Instead of teaching leadership, they have to step in and actualize that uh, process from, from the beginning. So there's the the uh, Tony K. Bovera Scholar Activism Program, and then there's also the Activist Practicum, which it really the students uh, had me pull out of or develop from, uh, it was an assignment, again as an assignment in the uh, Women and Social Resistance, or Gender and Social Resistance Movements course, and they said, well, this needs to be a component in and of itself, and so taking uh, feminist models, feminist, you know, the person who's political, um, the fact that um, the, I uh, just was thinking about, you know, rethinking leadership, which we look at in, in looking at gender and social movements, uh, you know, uh, theorists like Belinda Robnett, who talks about bridge leading versus, you know, which is uh, creating those connections versus hierarchical, you know, the leader versus the masses kind of patriarchal divide embodying that in the individual connections to outside organizations that, uh, that have to be movement or social change oriented and have to, and the students have to also reflect on what their, not just you know, what their service to the organization was, but what their contribution to social change in that process has been. So I think those are, those, those are, those are some of the aspects that keep us on our toes and kind of uh, keep us from getting um, complacent in just course development, not just, because course development is a big thing, uh, just not to undermine that, but just in the classroom that takes us out of the classroom and, and into, back into the movement and keeps us radicalized.